Am I live? You are. Okay. Well, hi, everyone. Now it's official. We're starting the program. Uh, I'm Richard Naylor from the Friends of the Pine Bush Community, and we co-sponsor, as you probably know, with commission staff every monthly science lecture. Uh, today it's Earthworms of the Northeast. And during the program, as Dylan mentioned to someone, you can use the Q&A option, which is kind of our pre preference. Just type your question and the speaker and Dylan will see the questions and then she will provide them to our presenter at the end. If you have a laptop or a desktop, you might have to move your, your mouse or cursor to the bottom to see them. And if you have a, an iPad, I kind of throw up my hands because I don't have one, but swipe one way or another, uh, you probably know about that. So before Dylan introduces our speaker today, let me tell you about next month's science lecture webinar, Thursday, October 15th uh, at 7 p.m. And it will be on microplastic pollution in the Mohawk River watershed. Questions like how extensive is microplastic pollution in our region? Is the Mohawk River contaminated? What about the smaller tributaries flowing into the Mohawk River? Uh, those questions will be dealt with and answered. Our presenter, Jacqueline Smith, uh, she's a PhD adjunct and research professor of geology at Union College. Uh, she will be here to do the program. Now, back to today and over you, to you, Dylan. All right. Thank you, everyone, so much for joining us tonight. Um, it's my great pleasure to introduce our speaker tonight, Dr. Timothy McKay. Um, he is at Colgate University. He's been there for 20 years, um, but he did some traveling around first. Um, he got his bachelor's of science um, at the University of Florida, um, then moved to Pennsylvania and got his master's of science at Penn State, um, and then back south to Georgia um, to get his PhD in ecology. And both his uh, master's and PhD work focused on small mammals um, where he started learning about uh, invertebrates because that's what the small mammals were eating. Um, and so recently he's made the switch to worms. Um, he still has a place in his heart for small mammals, but um, is finding some very interesting stories with the worms. He's been working on them for the last 10 years. So I'm very much looking forward to your lecture tonight. Um, Dr. McKay, thank you so much for joining us this evening. Oh, thank, thank you, Dylan. I'll, I'll go ahead and uh, share my screen here. And Dylan, please let me know if anything seems amiss in terms of the, the video. So, so thanks, thanks to Dylan and everybody at the Albany uh, Pine Bush Preserve for the opportunity to uh, talk with you all about earthworms in Northeastern North America. Um, Earthworms, we were just talking before the, uh, before the seminar about the fact that every child is familiar with earthworms. Every, every kid knows something about earthworms. And despite that fact, I think you'll be surprised this evening to uh, realize just how much we don't know about, uh, about earthworms, uh, e even here in the, in the very well-studied Northeast. So the story of uh, earthworms in the Northeast is really um, pretty complicated. It's, it's more complicated than most people realize. And it's a story that involves uh, three different players, or at least the way I think of it, it's kind of like a, a story with three parts that are interacting with one another. And that's how I'll sort of organize the talk is, is within these three different parts. But before I get into the details of the worms of the Northeast, I need to talk a little bit about earthworms generally. And so first, just why earthworms are uh, so important in the ecosystems in which they're found, which has to do with what they eat. Everybody knows that earthworms are decomposers, right? They eat um, plant, dead plant material, or they eat soil with damp, dead plant material uh, in it. The, uh, the picture in the upper left here actually was the first uh, sort of smoking gun evidence that earthworms actually can be bona fide herbivores too. That's an earthworm munching a green leaf off of a living plant. That was pretty big news back in, uh, back in 2013. 
but still it's a pretty unusual thing for worms to be like real herbivores. For the most part, they eat dead plant material. They digest that material, facilitating decomposition and the mineralization of nutrients from that stuff back to the soil. So they play this role in sort of the recycling of nutrients in, uh, in forests. And ever since Darwin, who I think is um, in attendance here this evening, uh, ever, ever since Darwin wrote his last book on earthworms, uh, biologists have been uh, pretty uh, aware of the fact that earthworms are particularly good at what they do. There are lots of other animals that do the same sort of thing, millipedes, isopods, lots of fly larvae and so forth, but none of those seem to be as effective at recycling nutrients from dead plant material as, uh, as earthworms. And that's evidenced in this kind of side-by-side -side picture of two um, areas of forest floor that are cut in cross-section. The, the ecosystem, the forest type is the same in both of these, but on the left, you're looking at a forest floor with few or, or no earthworms. And on the right, a forest floor with lots of earthworms. And so in the presence of lots of earthworms, notice that there's not much leaf litter at the top. They munch all that stuff up, they bring it down and incorporate it into the mineral soil. On the left, there's still a very thick layer of, uh, of leaf litter. And um, it doesn't matter how many millipedes or isopods or fly larvae or anything else come into the system, they can never compensate for this dramatic difference that you find when you have lots of earthworms uh, versus few or, or no earthworms. And, these, and this difference has a lot of consequences, as you might imagine, for plants that are germinating at the, at the ground level, animals, salamanders, my shrews, lots of different kinds of invertebrates that live in this ecosystem. In fact, we sampled a bunch of places in, um, in uh, central New York and related the abundance of earthworms to the abundance of other sorts of animals like beetles and spiders and, and whatnot. And we found a really pretty dramatic relationship between the two things. Along the x-axis here, you have abundance of earthworms. And on the y-axis, you have the abundance of basically everything else that lives in the leaf litter. And there's a dramatic drop off, as you can see, as you get the uh, um, significant abundances of earthworms. There just is very little of anything else that can live when you have a lot of earthworms in a system. And it's because of what we were just talking about, the fact that when you have a lot of earthworms, they, you know, they take that high rise apartment and they turn it into, you know, a bunch of ranch houses or something. They just greatly simplify the volume of the habitat. So I guess the first thing is just to convince you that it matters. And the, the other thing I need to talk about, which is a general sort of thing, is just sort of the glacial history of the Northeast and how this might have affected earthworms. So if you go back 20,000 years, of course, there's a mile over the top of the Albany pine bush. And as those sheets recede, um, Earthworms and, you know, like everything else, they kind of start moving northward to recolonize deglaciated northern North America. But earthworms seem to have moved northward um, very slowly relative to other sorts of creatures. I mean, they are earthworms and they just kind of, you know, intercross, but um, it's been almost sort of like surprisingly. Um, slow in terms of recolonization. And the evidence that we have for this slow recolonization is the fact that if you look at this, this red line is the southernmost limit of glaciation. If you look on the northern side of that red line, you find relatively few native North American earthworm species, or at least ones that we're confident are uh, native to North America. So there are, as I'll talk about shortly, there are a lot of native North American worms, but they are, you know, by and large found south of that red line with some really important exceptions, which I'll talk about. So this idea that um, 
most earthworms above that red line are not native, that they, that they came in with European settlers. That's called the uh, post-quaternary introduction hypothesis. It was uh, presented, it was argued by this fellow, Gordon Gates. Um, Gordon Gates actually was convinced of a very strict sort of interpretation of this idea. Basically, he was not convinced that there were any native earthworms above the red line, just sort of like the glaciers came down, they went back and worms did nothing to move northward. Uh, as I'll talk about shortly, we, we no longer think that that's the case, but it's been relatively recent that uh, a lot of ecologists have become convinced of it. All right, so with that sort of preamble out of the way then, um, I'll introduce the three parts of the Northeastern North American worm drama. And I kind of like Western, so I'm using this good, the bad, and the ugly uh, metaphor here. But so the, the three groups or the three components of this are native earthworms, and these are specifically ones that are found north of that red line. Um, and then two groups of exotic species. One, a group of exotic species from Europe that have been in North America for several hundred years. We don't know how long, but um, several hundred years, maybe 400 years. Um, and then uh, finally, there's a group of invasive species that have come in more recently from Asia that represent a different kind of earthworm than either of the first two. And I'm gonna to refer to these as pheretomoids, but I'll, I'll give you some other sort of synonyms for that, for that group. But anyway, we've got these two groups of invasives that have come in at different times. The European invasives came in hundreds, hundreds of years ago. The pheretomoids have come in within the last hundred years and really just in the last couple of decades have swept through the Northeast. And then there are the native species. And so I'm going to sort of move through each of these three. I'm going to talk mostly about the first group and the last group, because these are, you know, I think where most of the action is right now. The, the group in the middle, these European invasives, in a way that's kind of old news, but I'm going to talk about them for just a minute to maybe convince you that they're not, they're not completely old news. But first, the native species. And um, I would bet that somebody in attendance here this evening was surprised to learn that there were any native earthworms in the Northeast. Probably many of you were, because it's the exotic species that get all the attention. So there was this you know, paper in the Atlantic last year, New York Times article uh, over the summer. Everybody talks about the exotic species and uh, ecologists have done a very good job of sort of vilifying uh, exotic earthworms, particularly in the upper Midwest, places like Wisconsin, but also to a lesser extent here in the Northeast. And people don't think about native species, and they certainly, I don't think, think about the, the fact that native species might actually need our help in terms of conservation. So there are a lot of native North American earthworms. This pie chart represents the whole diversity of earthworms in North America, north of Mexico. It's like 180 species. There's about 120 species of native earthworms. Again, most of those are below the red line, but there's 120 species of them. The remaining about third of the species are these exotic groups from Europe uh, and Asia. The, the kind of caveat here is that even in places farther south, most of the really abundant species, the species that you end up having to step over on the sidewalk or that you might use for fishing or that you might use in your composter, those are still um, exotic species. So uh, even, if you're, even if you live farther south, the chances that you interact regularly with native earthworms is relatively low compared to the more ubiquitous uh, exotic species from Europe and Asia. But I'm gonna start off talking about the, the group of native species that are found north of that red line. There are, to our modern, to our understanding at the mo moment, um, five species that fall into that category. 
And this is my favorite one. This is Isonoides lombergi. It's the American, we call it the American bog worm for reasons that I'll describe in a second. Um, so just, I mean, worms, to a lot of people, a worm's a worm, but if you just kind of like gaze at this one for a moment, it's, I think, a particularly attractive worm. It has this kind of uh, purplish slate hue uh, to it that is uh, in life very distinctive. It definitely does not look like a night crawler, although it's as big as, uh, as a night crawler. But the reason that I like this worm so much, I think, is its resilience. It lives in some really extreme environments and it has held on in lots of uh, really extreme uh, habitats. So I'm going to talk mostly about this worm because it illustrates pretty well how little we know about native worms in the Northeast. So if you go back to 1995, this is the only distribution map that was um, available for Isonoides, for that, that bog worm species. And so just focusing in on the, the Northeast here, um, this is kind of the same sort of thing. The shaded area is where that distribution map said that they would occur. And all the blue dots represent places where they are um, known to exist based on published records. You'll notice here that there's only one, I think you can see my cursor here, uh, there's only one a dot in all of New York State, and it's found um, you know, very high, in very, very, very far north in New York State. That was a point that nobody was taking seriously, actually. Um, ecologists believed that it was a, uh, a record that was um, just due to somebody's discarded fishing bait, and because it was right next to some place where people fished, and the person who published it published it kind of apologetically like that, that it was probably an erroneous record just due to somebody's discarded fishing bait, and you know it's not found anywhere else, at anywhere within hundreds of miles of there, so it's probably not a good record, and that's why the distribution map what didn't stretch up to, to get that point. So whenever I started working on worms in New York State, this is what I was looking at, and I figured that I would probably never see an Isonoides lombergi for my, you know, entire working life. I mean, they're just not that common and they're not found where I was, I thought. Therefore, I was really surprised when some students of mine that were working in a nearby wetland area brought back a group of earthworms that they found moving around right in the middle of a bog, a real bog that I'll show you pictures of in a second, a place where no self-respecting earthworm really should be. They brought these worms back and I keyed them out and they were Isonoides lombergi. So the name of that bog is Fiddler's Green and is found you know, where that red dot is. And so all of a sudden that other blue dot doesn't seem so weird. But this was really pretty eye-opening that we found it in upstate New York, that it was found in this really interesting habitat in a, in a bog. Here's a picture of, of Fiddler's Green. It's a real bog. It's a pretty late stage uh, bog, but it's quaking still. If you look down, it's pitcher plants and sundews and all that business. There's no mineral soil. The worms just swim in and among the uh, little branches of sphagnum. It's really pretty remarkable. But this uh, stimulated some students and I to work the next summer to go around upstate New York looking for it. We went to lots of places like this. This is another bog that I'm blanking on the name uh, of it right now where we, where we found them. We ran our fingers through a lot of this stuff and we found them in a lot of places. So all of these red dots represent places where either we found them or a collaborator of ours, Rebecca Pender, who's at Columbia Green College, um, Community College, uh, she found them in a bunch of her sites in the Catskills. So it did not take that long to find those, those records. About 50% of the places where we looked, as long as we looked in a, in a wetland area, particularly if it was one that had kind of an extreme pH profile, we found it. So I personally don't think that it's all that uncommon. It's just that nobody's really ever looked for it. 
Um, in terms of, you know, what is its real geographic distribution in the Northeast? I have no idea. Nobody does because I, we haven't gone farther east looking for it. It very well might be found in Vermont, New Hampshire. We, we don't know that yet, which is pretty surprising, I think. Another surprising thing about it, you know, related to the bog thing, is that, that this worm survives really pretty extreme environments. The water in that Fiddler's Green has a pH of under four, and we found it in two other very acidic places, another bog and another swamp that was very acidic. And at those places, there were no other earthworm species found with it. Uh, we also found it in very out ends some swamps that are very out have a really broad range in phs it, pro it probably is uniquely able to survive the ph natural in the north. This one, Spargonopolis Iceni, um, this is found in similar kinds of habitats. It, it's in wetland areas, but it tends to be found in riparian habitats, in kind of organic uh, substrates alongside moving water, usually. Um, and this is a species that we have known a little bit more about. We've, we've known for some time that it's found significantly above that that glacial line. But again, people haven't really been looking for it very often. For example, uh, just in the last two years, we found the first records for uh, Vermont. Um, and I would be very surprised if it's not in New Hampshire but, and Maine, uh, but it's not been found there yet. So I'll just pause with those first two species out of the five because they're kind of interesting in that they are wetland worms. And it's pretty unusual for a worm to live in a wetland. There, there is a group of species of earthworms that do that, but it's not that common. And so, <clears throat> and so the fact that two of the five species of native worms in the Northeast, the fact that they are wetland species is interesting. And it really makes you wonder, you know, it, is, it, is it the case that exotic species are sort of driving out all other worms and only the ones that live in the wetlands where there aren't as many exotics they can hang on or or was there something about the recolonization of the north following glacial retreat that facilitated the movement of uh, you know maybe through mass movement of water because the eggs the little cocoons can be dispersed by water um, what, does that have something to do with it? I think that there's an interesting story there, but I'm just not sure what it is just yet. So the remaining three species of natives are all in the same genus Bimastos, and they are little tiny reddish worms, like I should have a scale bar here, but that's only like an inch and a half long. A couple of them are uh, shown here by Mastos parvus and tumidus. We call them bark worms because they tend to be found in rock wood. Um, and we've known about these again for some time. There are a number of published records above the glacial line, but very sparse and never very abundant. And so the impression of those two species of bimastos has always been that they're quite rare, very cryptic, not very common, probably not very ecologically dominant or important. But that kind of changed a bit a few years ago, just three years ago, when a species that we had long believed was a European exotic species called Dendrodrillus rubidus was reclassified to bring it right within a North American earthworm group. And all of a sudden, a lot of other evidence related to this species made sense that this, this is in fact a native species, this Dendrodrillus rubidus, which we now call Bimastos rubidus. So that's the third of the three little reddish worms that are native. And the reason that this was such a coup is that this one is not nearly so um, uncommon 
or you know, hard to find as those other two species of bimastos. This county map shows you all the counties where they are you know, formally described from. I think every single white county on here is just because nobody's looked. You know, we just looked around a little bit, found those, the red dots you know, in counties where they hadn't been recorded. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if they were found in every single, every single one of those counties. So this is a pretty widespread species and gives us a different kind of uh, uh, impression of what pre-Columbian earthworm life was like in the Northeast. So, you know, if you go back before European settlement in the Northeast, we've got the these two wetland worms that in the Northeast, and then and then now we've got this bimastos that is pretty widespread in the uplands and it probably was, you know, a thousand years ago, just as a little bit different impression of, uh, you know, the worm world before European settlement. Then of the native earthworm uh, business in common compared to say the nightcrawler or the red worm or a lot of these other European species that dominate agricultural. Firstly, behaviorally, they're different. Um, we don't call them jumping worms or crazy worms or snake worms for nothing. They, they really act differently. And uh, students did some work to try to identify, uh, students of mine, to identify the ways specifically that they act differently. And we came to two things that they do that other species of earthworms rarely ever do. And the first is that they use a serpentine kind of locomotion, like a snake. I'll show you a video shortly uh, of this. And you saw a little bit in that cluster of worms in the in the bowl. So they they locomote like a snake, whereas most earthworms use rectilinear locomotion to uh, to move. The other thing they do is they flail their body back and forth, kind of like a fish. They're like trying to touch their tail to their their mouth and and back and forth like that as a kind of semi rigid thing. Most earthworms don't do that. They'll flail around, but the whole body doesn't move in that sort of stiff, coordinated way. So those two things really behaviorally are pretty distinctive about them. They, they actually live their lives differently, too, in terms of the annual cycle. These three species in particular, this isn't true for all the phoretomoids, but these three northeastern species are annuals. So they hatch from eggs in the spring. They grow up through the growing season. By November, December, they're dead, but they've laid a lot of eggs. The eggs over winter, and then they hatch again in the spring. This is different than most earthworms. Most earthworms actually live many years. Uh, nightcrawlers can live a dozen years or more. And so these things, their whole sort of strategy is to develop very quickly, and then to crank out as many eggs as possible before they die at the end of the year. It allows them to put a greater fraction of their energy into making babies while they're alive and then they, and then they die. So in terms of like a strategy, it's sort of like a weedy strategy, like ragweed or something. You know, they, they grow fast, they produce a lot of offspring. The offspring disperse very widely, although we don't have very good measures of just how widely they can uh, disperse, but they disperse really widely. And then they're laying eggs and they build up a kind of a pool of eggs in the soil that you know, uh, feeds on itself over time and becomes really abundant. Typical, uh, typical European worms, native worms, they grow more slowly. They put more of their energy into survival, less into reproduction. Their populations can't grow quite as fast as the jumping worms do. Another interesting thing that's different about them is that they are better able to eat lignin to get energy out of lignin. So lignin is uh, a really recalcitrant component of wood. That's something that's just very difficult for any animal to eat to get energy out of. But they either themselves or with a symbiotic microbiome, 
they produce these uh, lignanolytic uh, enzymes that allow them to break down wood better than other earthworms. This is important because it allows them to live really well in mulch, in just pure mulch. So a lot of the gardens that I visit that I find them in, they will be you know, right in the middle of just a really thick layer of mulch and they're doing just fine in there because they can take advantage of the energy from the little, you know, little bits off of those, those wood pieces, but other worms can't do nearly so well. And I think this is an important part of their, the, the reason that they've just um, dispersed around the Northeast so well because a lot of gardeners will bring them in with contaminated mulch. They'll become really abundant in their gardens and then they'll spread to adjacent woodlands. You know, I, I'm convinced that, you know, probably three quarters or more of the times that they make it into a woodland, it's because they were brought in somewhere nearby in mulch. So here's kind of a model for how that might work. You've got these some kind of central places with contaminated mulch. Gardeners take advantage of that stuff, like a municipal mulch pile or something like that. They make it into gardens, they become very infested, and then they move from those gardens out into woodlands. Over the last two summers, I've surveyed about 30 gardens of master gardeners in the Syracuse area, and about uh, 18 of those 30 I think it was 18 of those 30 gardens had jumping worms. Of those 18, about a dozen of those folks knew that they had them. And so to about six of the, the, the gardeners, it was a surprise. And so I just bring up that anecdote because these are master gardeners. They're people that garden very cleanly, very conscientiously that, you know, so it, it's sort of like, it's really hard to avoid uh, bringing these into your garden if you're exchanging plants at all, if you're bringing mulch or compost in at all. Um, and I can talk more about those sort of applied gardening aspects um, it, during questions if you've got them. So where are they in the Northeast? They're, they're pretty widely distributed, but it's hard to tell exactly where they are because it's happening so fast. If you just look at the published records, which would be the light blue dots here, they look pretty widely distributed through the Northeast, but there are a lot more places that are either dark blue or orange or tan. And those are all records that are um, listed in the different kinds of citizen science applications where like IMAP invasives or iNaturalist, some of you might be familiar with these, you can record the presence of species and at least in the case of IMAP invasives, there's a professional vetting of records to verify them based on pictures and so forth. And so, you know, based on those citizen science applications, we've got a much, you know, more extensive depiction of their presence through the Northeast. But interestingly, you know, all the states don't kind of buy into those different um, citizen science apps the same way. For example, Pennsylvania as a state is not participating in with uh, IMAP invasives. And so we were re actually really surprised when we sent out a survey to gardeners, master gardeners throughout the Northeast that so many master gardeners from Pennsylvania reported that they had jumping worms. In this uh, map, the red dots are like the new ones from what you were just looking at. And they are all positive reports from master gardeners that say that they have jumping worms, um, you know, based on the evidence and, you know, pictures that they've seen and so forth. So these aren't probably 100% correct, but, you know, there, there were a ton of reports that came out of Pennsylvania, which jives actually with some conversations I've had recently with, um, with people down there. So they're all over the Northeast. As of right now, um, there's only one record in Canada. It's just, I can't remember where it is. It's just kind of like right over the line someplace or right over the river. Um, but it seems based on uh, this climate model that they can probably extend quite a ways into Canada. All the shaded area here represents places that um, these authors believe that jumping worms can live based on their temperature tolerances and the length of the growing season that they need. So, um, you know, if they are able to spread throughout 
this area. I mean, this is most of the inhabited place of places in uh, in Canada, pretty extensively in Canada. So lastly, you know, I mean, so I'm trying kind of painting this dramatic pic picture. I mean, how bad are these jumping worms really? A lot of the evidence that we have for the negative effects of these phoretomoids is very similar to the evidence we have of the negative effects of the European species whenever they become really abundant. They eat the litter layer down. It leads sometimes to increased erosion. Um, you end up with bare spots in the forest, reduction in seedlings, reduction in things like salamanders and whatnot. But a lot of the evidence is pretty similar to what we know for European species. There are two, two reasons, though, why we might be a little bit nervous to, um, about them in addition to that. Two reasons why they might end up being worse than the European species. Firstly, uh, their castings, that is their poop, is a little bit different than the castings of European species. It's very granular and kind of like coffee grounds here. Um, and it tends to accumulate as they become really well established. This layer of castings gets deeper and deeper and it leads to greater rates of drainage. These little aggregates, these little soil aggregates are very uh, resistant to you know, breaking down. And so it, it rains, the rain just goes right through that stuff. It doesn't re-homogenize it. And so gardeners anyway complain that a lot of plants uh, don't root very well in that casting layer. When it builds up in forests, that probably leads to a reduction in the ability of certain plants to germinate or grow as seedlings. We really don't know yet, but there's reason to suspect that that might be bad. And then the second thing is just that they become really, really abundant uh, sometimes. So this picture is showing, you know, uh, I think she told me it was about a half an hour of harvesting worms out of her garden. This is a uh, friend, Diane Emmert in, in Syracuse. Uh, here's just a picture showing how abundant they can get. They're also nicely illustrating that uh, serpentine locomotion. This is an area that's pretty heavily infested in, in Wisconsin. So to sum up then, um, earthworms in, in the Northeast are this kind of like interesting system of three interacting components. We've got the native species that I would argue deserve our positive, the two groups of uh, invasive species from Europe that have been around for a long time. time but might still be on the move into they're moving really fast they're invading very quickly the uh, consequences of that invasion are currently uh, pretty poorly known and with that I'd be happy to take any questions that you have all right thank you so so much um, so if anybody has any questions go ahead and type them into the Q&A or into the um, webinar chat um, I do have a few already um, so Richard asks, are there fewer earthworms in sandy soil like the pine bush? Yeah, generally that's true. Um, you know, keeping in mind that earthworms need the organic fraction of any soil. That's, that's how they get their energy. And also there's an abrasive effect of a lot of sandy soils that we think is harmful to earthworms. So generally speaking, that's, that's true. Um, but I'll actually be very interested to look at some of the kind of lower areas in, um, in, in the, you know, in and among those sandy habitats for whether there may be worms in those areas. But generally speaking, in sandy habitats, worms are pretty scarce. All right. A lot of questions about what can be done or is there a way to control the jumping worms? Yeah, that's that's really a tough one right now. Um, there's there's work that's being done in uh, three different places. There's there's a group in Vermont that's working on this, one in Wisconsin, and then we're doing some experiments too to basically figure out how to best kill them. And so I'll just 
give you kind of a rundown of some things that do work. So vinegar works, baking soda works, saponins, which are surfactants, um, sort of like naturally derived surfactants, those can kill uh, earthworms. They're sometimes used as wetting agents in soils. Um, and also some microbes that were harvested from um, earthworms that became diseased and died in nature. The group in Vermont uh, cultured microbes from those worm cadavers and then basically weaponized that stuff, that, those microbes, to swab like living uh, worms and were able to kill them that way, which is interesting. Uh, sort of like, you know, bio, biotic control uh, mechanism. The problem with all these things and what I need to quickly say, you know, before you go out and buy something is that we've not yet come to a recommendation that we know is safe. So for example, the vinegar, we know we can kill them with vinegar, but right now the dose of vinegar that we can kill them with would also kill your tomatoes or your grass. And so nobody's going to want to do that. So the experiments now are trying to find the sweet spot. Is there a way that we can kill the worms without killing your tomatoes, you know, with, with vinegar? Uh, same thing with baking soda. Um, the saponins, those can be harmful to salamanders and other soft-bodied invertebrates. So we're currently working on experiments to try to figure out what safe doses of those are, um, you know, with respect to other aspects of the local ecology that you might be concerned about. Uh, those can be particularly dangerous if they get into streams. Um, and then the, the microbes thing, I don't, I'm not sure how far they've gone toward, you know, I mean, it's one thing to have like a little Q-tip with some microbes on it, run around your yard swabbing worms, um, but it's another thing to have some way that that can be, you know, distributed uh, in a way that would broadcast, you know, kill, kill the worms in a habitat. So, uh, I mean, I guess the bottom line is that there's work ongoing, but right now there's nothing that can be recommended without a lot of caveats, unfortunately. Okay. Yeah. Scott mentioned, um, he didn't want to damage the, the native worms. So do they yeah. frequently exist with the, with the, no. So uh, if you're if you're working on your property, it would be very unusual that you um, that you had to worry about uh, harming native species. If you might have like bimastos rubidus there, um, but in most places that become in, infested with jumping worms, the other the worms that are coexisting with them are European exotic species, and a lot of gardeners actually care about those and you know i'm about stay val you know valued neutral on, on european exotics because you know they do do a lot to recycle nutrients and a lot of agricultural you know especially no-till systems they can be an important important part of you know rejuvenating worms without killing european species right now we've, we've got nothing that we think is that specific at this at this moment. Uh, we did have one person say, um, I have heard earthworms are good for my organic garden in the community garden project. Wrong? <laughs> yeah, so it's just what I uh, said there. I mean, they do um, recycle nutrients. I, I have yet to meet a gardener that is glad that they have jumping worms. You know, correct me if there's anybody here that you know, has a lot of these things and they like them, let me know. But we, we did a survey of like 500 gardeners last year and 201, if they had them, they disliked them. Mm -hmm. And a large fraction of those people liked their European worms, but they disliked the jumping worms. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so that's uh, it. But it, it, you know, the uh, European species do perform this function, the rejuvenation of soil, decomposition of dead organic matter, and that's valid. That's, um, it's, 
but although it's a little bit of an overstatement to say that one needs them, I remember kind of growing up with the impression that if you didn't have worms in your garden, it just wasn't going to work. And that's, that's not actually true. And, you know, I would just bring up again the fact that there are a lot of woods in central New York that have no worms and they're perfectly fine. You know, I mean, uh, it doesn't really, things recycle, they just recycle slower. The turnover rate is slower for everything without, without worms, but it still, still works. All right. Uh, Darwin asks, why do jumping worms jump? And what is the mechanism for how they jump? Are they doing it with tissue contractions? Yeah, so the, um, we believe that it's an anti-predator mechanism because they always do it when you pinch them. You know, like this is how we can get the, them to do it in the lab. They're there. If you give them a pinch, much like a bird would do, you know, but this is one to be one of their main predators, either a bird or a shrew, you know, that would be giving them a nip. They'll almost invariably thrash around like that, do the, the jumping. So we, we think that it's an anti-predator mechanism and it's there, the, the actual, you know, like what, what's going on there is actually pretty interesting. Their salomic fluid, the fluid that's in their body, that's not like what's in their guts, but like in their, the cavity of their body is under greater pressure than the salomic fluid of your, the common European species. So like if you take a night crawler and you just kind of like squeeze it, it's kind of like mushy a little bit. But if you grab one of these jumping worms, if it's healthy and you do that same thing, it feels very tight. You know, so that, that fluid is under more pressure, which gives them a more rigid kind of backbone. And then that allows them to thrash against their own, you know, sort of like, you know, water hydrostatic skeleton kind of a thing. And that's what allows them to get more force and launch themselves off the, uh, off the soil. Crazy. Yeah. Uh, Christopher asks, are there any fossils of worms in old swamps or even rocks? Oh, that's a great question. Yeah. So there is exactly one. There, um, there is a, there's a long story with this I'll abbreviate. So there was a worm biologist who became a geologist. And when they became a geologist, they were doing sediment coring for some completely other purpose. And they found uh, what they believed was an earthworm cocoon and later confirmed that it was an earthworm cocoon in sediments that were 11,000 years old. And this was up in Kitchener, Ontario. So Kitchener, Ontario, 11,000 years ago, they found a little cocoon. The, the most interesting part of this is that they identified it to species because this was a worm person who became the geologist. So they knew their worms. They identified it to Dendrodrillus rubidus, which is the species that was reclassified just three years ago. But at the time, everybody believed that that species was a European exotic. And so when they published this, here's this cocoon 11,000 years ago from Dendrodrillus rubidus. Everybody was like, well, that, didn't, that wasn't even here until the European settlers came. So you must be wrong. The paper was ignored for 30 years until three years ago whenever that it was reclassified. Now all of a sudden that guy looks like a genius, you know, because they were able to figure out, despite everybody believing differently, they were able to figure out that that worm was here before Europeans were here. That's, that's it though, as far as I know, at least in North America, there, there may be um, data from Europe that I'm not aware of, but um, Europe or Asia, but um, in North America, that's the only, uh, the only fossil cocoon that I'm aware of. And it would be the cocoons that would, that would be fought, that, you know, that would be in those sediments. I've always wanted to do a study like that because I think it could be fruitful. Hmm. Uh, Hannah says, has the jumping worms enzyme, which allows them to break down lignin, been isolated and named? Not to my knowledge. No, I think there, it was a, the paper that I showed the snippet of was a group out of the University of Vermont that I just identified the action of the enzyme. Um, but I think that that's the extent of it. So, you know, there's an organic chemist asking the question that wants some work, so go for it. Um, she also asked, um, has any species been observed to have a preference for feeding on the jumping worms? 
Yeah, that's a good, great question because it would be fantastic if there was. Um, what most evidence suggests is that most things that will eat other kinds of worms will eat them, but a lot of species show a slight preference away from jumping worms rather than preferring to eat them. They, they seem to taste um, worse than, uh, than European species to mammal predators. So I have mostly just anecdotes um, about this, but I have set up little battles with my shrews in the lab and different kinds of earthworms. And, you know, my shrews will attack them and, you know, bite into them, but they almost invariably will thrash their head around and wipe their face on the ground like they want to get that stuff out of their mouth. Hmm. But then, like a good shrew, it goes back anyway and, you know, keeps attacking and eventually it's going to kill it anyway. You know, they, they are eaten by birds, by salamanders, uh, by shrews, by things, you know, but um, there's, like I said, some evidence for salamanders too, that salamanders don't quite like them as much as the European species. I don't know of anything that prefers to eat them. I wonder if the lignin that they're eating makes them unpalatable. I don't know. So they, you know, the salomic fluid that's under high pressure, one of the things that they'll do, this makes them even more endearing, if you grab them, sometimes they will squeeze their body and they have little pores on their back. And sometimes that salomic fluid will shoot out at you. <laughs> and it's like, they've done this to me a few times, which is always kind of startling, but it's not like it burns or anything. I mean, I guess I've never gotten any in my eyes, but it's always made me think that there's maybe something in there, salomic fluid, that is a little bit maybe bitter or something. And they're just trying to give like the salamander a taste so that they'll leave it alone and then make their way off. I don't yeah. know. Uh, let's see. Margie says, do jumping worms thrive in mulched leaves or more in the wood mulch? Both. Yeah, they, they can be in mulched leaves as well. Yeah, so, you know, for gardeners that want to avoid them, my recommendation would be if you can, if you can get compost that is treated in a way that eliminates weeds, you know, at that sort of temperature level, that will kill worm eggs as well. And so, uh, for example, I'm in Syracuse area, there's a, there's an um, agency that, you know, okra that makes compost and they treat it in a way to kill weeds. And um, I'm pretty certain that that's clean as far as jumping worms go. But they also make mulch and they don't get that hot. And that is regularly infested with jumping worms. And a lot of gardeners in Syracuse are kind of uh, not happy that that's how they believe that they got them. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, is there any cooperations between countries or states to address the issue um, preventing further spreading, for example, between Canada and the U.S.? That's a good question. Uh, I'm trying to remember. We have a Canadian collaborator, John David Moore, who has uh, kept track of that a little bit. And I can't remember in one direction. Um, you can't bring soil. I, I, I'm not sure. Maybe I just should stop talking because I, I, uh, I, I'm not sure what the rules are. There are no agreements specific to jumping worms, though. I, I think that there are, I mean, USDA, since the 19, I think it was in the 1970s, that the rules became much more strict in terms of bringing in soil internationally. And so probably most of the jumping worms that were brought in were brought in before that time when you would buy, you know, a, a potted plant that was actually potted in Japan and then brought over in its pot with the soil and then given to you. That no longer, my understanding is, can be done. Plants have to be bare rooted and then repotted in sterile, uh, sterile substrates for, uh, to, to be imported. Um, and so, uh, yeah, but related to international agreements, nothing that I'm aware of specific to jumping worms. All right. Neil says, excellent presentation. Thank you. 
Uh, prior to Western expansion, Western New York was largely deforested and used for agriculture. Curious if fewer worms with greater distance to roads in Western New York could be a function of reforestation of the last hundred years. Mm, yeah, that's a really interesting, interesting point. The, the messiness of our data uh, relative to roads, relative to other houses and whatnot is exactly as the question suggests. The, the fact that the land use has been so long and so um, the, the history is so varied. And so sometimes we would have a site that would be way out in the middle of nowhere and we would find quite a few worms there, which we would be sort of surprised at given what we were seeing at most of the sites. But then we would learn that there was an old homestead not very long from there. And, and maybe, you know, that there may have been people living there a hundred years ago or something. And just the pattern of, you know, like where agriculture was done and where it wasn't done in the central New York, New York landscape just does not look the same as it does today. And so it's really complicated um, just in terms of how land use affects, uh, affects things. Um, but yeah, it would explain a lot if we, you know, were really able to model that out for sure. Um, let's see, Nancy says, why do earthworms tend to accumulate in leaf piles along walks and driveways following rains? Yeah, so what usually happens there, I think, is that they're, they're up here in the woods you know, in those leaves and then it rains and it washes the leaves down and they just kind of get passively carried with them because I've seen this same thing after a rain, you know, and, um, you know, so if you're a worm, the worst thing in your life is drying out. And so if you're in a micro habitat that's very moist, your tendency is to stay there unless it's raining. And then in which case you might you know, more freely move around. But these piles of leaves that get you know, accumulated at the bottom of the hill, they're very moist. And so they're really kind of nice little micro habitats. And so for days after a rain, I've kicked those things over and found lots of worms. And um, I know exactly, uh, exactly what you're talking about. Um, but I think that that's what's going on there mostly. I don't think it's that the worms are seeking those places out once they've, I think that the worms are getting washed down with the leaves and then they're just staying there for a little while. All right, let's see, Scott says, what is the population density of non-jumping earthworms in the soil surface? We observe American robins easily and quickly catch large numbers of them feeding their young. The density of worms seems very high, very many per square foot. Yeah, it's, the, the density of earthworms can be extremely high and it also can be zero. It's really variable. And one of, one of the factors is, okay, which species have gotten to that spot? Because not all earthworms do the same thing. And if you have a group of earthworms that are all doing slightly different things, then more of them can live together and create a more dense uh, earthworm assemblage. But another really important factor is the you know, kind of quality of the soil. So more basic pHs are better for earthworms generally, and having a lot of organic content is better, and having a more loamy, you know, sort of from clayey to loamy soil is better than loamy up to sandy um, in terms of the consistency of the soil. So if your soil is just right, um, and it's moist, that I should have mentioned that even first, because really that's the quality of soil that's the most important. If, if the soil is moist, and then it's got those other characteristics too in terms of pH and organic content and, and texture, then you can have extremely high earthworm abundances. And those could all be European earthworms. They, they could be, because they there are places where they become extremely abundant. Yeah. So kind of related, Richard asked, and I think this is in reference to your the pie chart you had in your presentation. Mm that if native worms are 72 percent why do we see so many exotics yeah so it's 72 percent of species but if we had a like a pie chart that was individuals you probably would have a hard time seeing the little sliver that was the native species just because i you know i think it's the the european species that have come over and now the phoretomoids 
um, they're just really good at expanding for whatever reason. Their, their biology is a little bit different. They do things just a little bit differently. And so it's given them kind of an edge in terms of attaining high population sizes related to uh, most of the native species. Now, if you go down to Alabama, like some lowland area in Alabama, you will find, I mean, you, it will not be very hard to find a native earthworm. Up here, though, it's virtually, I mean, it's really hard in the, in the Northeast, but if you go down to Maryland, it gets challenging, you know, Virginia, it's challenging, Georgia, it's easier, Alabama, you know, it depends on where you're at, you know, how conspicuous the native species are. Um, but, you know, at least in the northern half of the U.S., it's just th these European species and now the, the phoretomoids just dominate most habitats, unfortunately. All right. Um, when you buy earthworms for a home worm farms, are you purchasing invasives or natives? Yeah, that's a great question. So when you, if you're buying something for a compost system, uh, uh, almost invariably, what you are buying is a species called Icenia fetida, which is a species from Europe. But um, in the, at least up here in the Northeast, it's a great species to use because it almost never escapes into the woods. Um, it just doesn't live very well in the woods. I mean, sampling hundreds of sites in central New York, I've only found it once or twice and is very close to you know, somebody's garden or something like that. It just does not do very well in wild lands. Um, and so it's gonna probably just stay in your composter or in your compost pile. It'll do its job. They're great at, they're, they're able to live in really high densities and churn that stuff up. And in fact, it's, it's probably better if you're able to sort of seed your system with a lot of those things, because otherwise that's one of the places where jumping worms can come in and do really well. But if there's already a lot of these red, you know, red worm Mycenae fetitas in there, then they may be able to keep the jumping worms out. I don't know that that's true, but it's, it's possible. Awesome. So no, uh, worry, no worries with the composting worms. Hmm. Uh, do commercial worm casting fertilizers contain eggs of invasives? Uh, that's a good question. I, I do not know if, if they are, um, if they are marketed as having been treated to um, eliminate the risk of get of having weeds, then they will have killed all worm eggs in there if they have allowed it to get that hot. Um, but I'm not, I haven't messed with those at all to know from experience whether there are any uh, eggs in there. Um, yeah, I, I, I don't know. I mean, I'm kind of curious now with the question. I'm going to look into that. Um, Christopher has a follow up on the question about worms after rain. Um, he says, I've seen thousands of worms on my asphalt driveway dying after rain soaks the adjacent lawn. Yeah. Why these massive die offs after rain? Yeah, nobody really knows, but I presume you're talking about a springtime uh, event, at least around here in the early spring. A lot of worms, actually, um, a lot of them are the same species that I had in my presentation, the very first picture. It had a little pink nose on, to, on it. Um, that's called Aparectodia caliginosa, and that's the most common one here in central New York to exhibit these mass emergences in the spring. And they go all over the sidewalk and the road and they just die by the thousands. And nobody really knows um, what they're doing exactly. I mean, they, they're they not coming, I can tell you one thing for sure, they're not coming out of the ground to avoid drowning. That was That's sort of the old wives tale that when it rains, worms have to come out or they'll drown. But we know that these things can sit in cold water for like three days and because their metabolic rate is so low, they just do not need that much oxygen and they can breathe it right out of the, uh, right out of the water. And so it takes them a long time to drown. They can be drowned, but it takes them a long time. Uh, so they're, they seem to be intentionally doing something. And a lot of, at least these Aparectodia individuals are reproductively mature because they have that collar. Any worm that has that collar is mature and can mate and produce eggs. 
And so, so there's possible that they're looking for mates, although I've never seen Aparectodia mating, uh, you know, and I've gone out at night a lot to look at them when they're moving around in the spring. So I don't know that that's what they're doing. It may just be a kind of dispersal drive because most of the year they're living in the soil and their, their lateral movement is very limited because they basically have to eat their way if, as they go. But whenever it rains and, you know, in the spring, the soil tends to be the most saturated. They can come up. They're most free to move around. But then why do they die? Uh, you know, I think most people believe that it's just that they've gotten stuck on some area, like a sidewalk or a road, you know, remember that they can't see, they just crawled onto a rock. It seemed really, really big. And now they don't know how to get off of it. And they do that too long and they dry out. Um, and then once they, once their body water gets down so low, then they can't move very well. And then, then they'll probably die. Yeah. That's, that's probably the story, but it's a little bit mysterious. Chris, Christopher says his chickens love it, so. Yeah, yeah. Um, Rebecca says, what can gardeners do to preserve populations of native species? Yeah, so, I mean, um, again, the, the native species up here are gonna be a, one of two varieties. They're either gonna be species in wetlands, so, you know, like don't drain a swamp, I guess would be the, the lesson there, or, you know, do something to negatively affect a wetland area. And then the remaining three species, I didn't talk a lot about their natural history, but they tend to be found in very wild, old forests, not in little forest fragments next to gardens and never in my experience in gardens. So, you know, for an upland garden, there's, you know, virtually zero chance that you have any native species in there. So it would just be about the natural habitats that surround your property or that surround uh, your garden. And to just do the things that you would think would be good for the, you know, the natural ecology of the area. If you have a mature forest to maintain it as forest, that would be good for the bimastos individuals if there are bimasto species in there. And if you have wetlands to keep those uh, clean and, and as natural as possible would be good for the wetland natives. I'm going to save Darwin's question for last. I have a couple questions. And one was related to the native species um, and your um, feeling that they need some conservation assistance. Is that due to um, loss of habitat or are they being pushed out by these invasive species? Oh, uh, so I mean, I did, the, the, the question or the, the problem is that we don't know. You know, it, it seemed in my experience, there are there are many places where these jumping worms are making their way down into wetland habitats where I know that there are natives, where there's Isonoides and Sparganopolis. And so um, that might be a, a factor. And I guess I just wish that there was more, you know, sort of uh, acknowledgement of the potential for a conservation concern there, which would make it easier for me to write grant proposals and, and things to, to and gin up some interest in better understanding that possible negative effect. I mean, right now we don't know whether there are land use changes that are negatively impacting these things. It just could be the case because they are associated with habitats that are sometimes of conservation concern. Gotcha. Um, my other question was kind of weird, but um, you call you call the eggs cocoons, which in um, insects, you know, is like this kind of silk thing they put around a chrysalis is a cocoon. Yeah. So what does the word cocoon mean when you're talking about worms? Yeah, so that the collar that's around the, you know, that the collar that are on, on an earthworm, whenever the earthworm, <clears throat> the earthworm is going to lay its eggs, it produces a like a sheath of mucus with that collar. And then it like wiggles out of it. And as it's wiggling out of it, it drops its eggs into the mucus sheath. And as it pulls itself out in the end, it kind of like the ends dry up and pinch off. And that's the cocoon, it's dried mucus. Oh. And a lot of times there's one egg in there, but some species will lay multiple eggs in a cocoon. And so, and, and the worm people, do, they call them cocoons. And it's just, 
they're very resistant to, um, you know, like drying out to, you know, at least to cold. Um, and so they're, they're sort of environmental, you know, and they're very hard. They, they feel like little ball bearings or something like that. You really have to like cut it and rip it apart to, to get to the inside. So, so functionally, it sounds similar to. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. So Darwin's question. So Darwin has our last question guys. Um, and I think that wraps us up just about perfect for tonight. Darwin is wondering how many different species of earthworms are found in the pine bush. Oh, well, stay tuned, right? <laughs> yeah, I was, I was hoping to make it over this past uh, summer, wasn't able to, and I'm really looking forward to doing so uh, maybe next summer. Yes, we're looking forward to it too. We want to learn, we want to learn more about them in the pine bush. All right. Well, thank you again, everyone, so much for attending tonight. And um, thank you so much to Dr. McKay. I learned a ton. Um, I want to go out and look for earthworms now. So <laughs> thank, well, thank you. Thank you all. It was, it was fun. Great questions. Thank you. And we look forward to working with you uh, next year, hopefully. Great. <laughs> Great. <laughs> all right.